Hello friends, and welcome to the fourth installment in this calm reading of The Secret Garden. Tonight I will be reading for you chapters 10 through 12. Let us begin these chapters. Chapter 10 Dickon the sun shone down for nearly a week on the secret garden. The secret garden was what Mary called it when she was thinking of it. She liked the name, and she liked still more the feeling that when its beautiful old walls shut her in, no one knew where she was. It seemed almost like being shut out of the world in some fairy place. The few books she had read and liked had been fairy story books, and she had read of secret gardens in some of the stories. Sometimes people went to sleep in them for a hundred years, which she had thought must be rather stupid. She had no intention of going to sleep, and, in fact, she was becoming wider awake every day which passed at Misselthwaite. She was beginning to like to be out of doors. She no longer hated the wind, but enjoyed it. She could run faster and longer, and she could skip up to a hundred. The bulbs in the secret garden must have been much astonished. Such nice clear places were made round them that they had all the breathing space they wanted. And really, if Mistress Mary had known it, they began to cheer up under the dark earth and work tremendously. The sun could get at them and warm them, and when the rain came down, it could reach them at once, so they began to feel very much alive. Mary was an odd, determined little person, and now she had something interesting to be determined about. She was very much absorbed indeed. She worked and dug and pulled up weeds steadily, only becoming more pleased with her work every hour instead of tiring of it. It seemed to her like a fascinating sort of play. She found many more of the sprouting pale green points than she had ever hoped to find. They seemed to be starting up everywhere, and each day she was sure she found tiny new ones, some so tiny that they barely peeped above the earth. There were so many that she remembered what Martha had said about the snowdrops by the thousands, and about bulbs spreading and making new ones. They had been left to themselves for ten years, and perhaps they had spread, like the snowdrops, into thousands. She wondered how long it would be before they showed that they were flowers. Sometimes she stopped digging to look at the garden and tried to imagine what it would be like when it was covered with thousands of lovely things in bloom. During that week of sunshine, she became more intimate with Ben Weatherstaff. She surprised him several times by seeming to start up beside him as if she sprang out of the earth. The truth was that she was afraid that he would pick up his tools and go away if he saw her coming. So she always walked toward him as silently as possible. But in fact, he did not object to her as strongly as he had at first. Perhaps he was secretly rather flattered by her evident desire for his elderly company. Then, also, she was more civil than she had been. He did not know that when she first saw him, she spoke to him as she would have spoken to a native and had not known that a cross, sturdy old Yorkshire man was not accustomed to salam to his masters, and be merely commanded by them 
to do things. Thou'rt like the robin, he said to her one morning when he lifted his head and saw her standing by him. I never knows when I shall see thee, and which side they'll come from. He's friends with me now, said Mary. That's like him, snapped Ben Weatherstaff, making up to the women folk just for vanity and flightiness. There's nothing he wouldn't do for the sake of showing off and flirting his tail feathers. He's as full of pride as an egg's full of meat. He very seldom talked much, and sometimes did not even answer Mary's questions, except by a grunt. But this morning he said more than usual. He stood up and rested one hobnailed boot on top of his bait while he looked her over. How long hast thou been here? he jerked out. I think it's about a month, she answered. That's beginning to do Mrs. Thwaite credit, he said. Thou's a bit fatter than thou was, and thou's not quite so yellow. Thou looked like a young plucked crow when thou first came into this garden. Thinks I to myself, I never set eyes on an uglier, sour-faced young'un. Mary was not vain, and as she had never thought much of her looks, she was not greatly disturbed. I know I'm fatter, she said. My stockings are getting tighter. They used to make wrinkles. There's the robin, Ben Weatherstaff. There indeed was the robin, and she thought he looked nicer than ever. His red waistcoat was as glossy as satin, and he flirted his wings and tail and tilted his head and hopped about with all sorts of lively graces. He seemed determined to make Ben Weatherstaff admire him. But Ben was sarcastic. Ay, there thou art, he said. Thou can put up with me for a bit sometimes when thou's got no one better. Thou's been reddening up thy waistcoat and polishing thy feathers this two weeks. I know what thou's up to. Thou's courting some bold young madam, somewhere telling thy lies to her, about being the finest cock robin on Missle Moor, and ready to fight all the rest of them. Oh, look at him! exclaimed Mary. The robin was evidently in a fascinating, bold mood. He hopped closer and closer, and looked at Ben Weatherstaff more and more engagingly. He flew on the nearest currant bush, and tilted his head, and sang a little song right at him. Thou thinks thou'll get over me by doing that, said Ben, wrinkling his face up in such a way that Mary felt sure he was trying not to look pleased. Thou thinks no one can stand out against thee. That's what thou thinks. The robin spread his wings. Mary could scarcely believe her eyes. He flew right up to the handle of Ben Weatherstaff's spade and alighted on the top of it. Then the old man's face wrinkled itself slowly into a new expression. He stood still as if he were afraid to breathe as if he would not have stirred for the world, lest this robin should start away. He spoke quite in a whisper. Well, I'm danked, he said as softly as if he were saying something quite different. Thou dost know how to get at a chap, thou dost. Thus fair unearthly, thus so knowing. And he stood without stirring, almost without drawing his breath, until the robin gave another flirt to his wings and flew away. Then he stood looking at the handle of the spade, as if there might be magic in it. And then he began to dig again, and said nothing for several minutes. 
but because he kept breaking into a slow grin now and then, Mary was not afraid to talk to him. Have you a garden of your own? she asked. No, I am a bachelor and lodge with Martin at the gate. If you had one, said Mary, what would you plant? Cabbages and taters and onions. But if you wanted to make a flower garden, persisted Mary, what would you plant? Bulbs and sweet-smelling things, but mostly roses. Mary's face lighted up. Do you like roses? she said. Ben Wellestaff rooted up a weed and threw it aside before he answered. Well, yes, I do. I was learned that by a young lady I was a gardener to. She had a lot in a place she was fond of, and she loved them like they was children, or robins. I've seen her bend over and kiss him. He dragged out another weed and scowled at it. That were as much as ten years ago. Where is she now? asked Mary, much interested. Heaven, he answered, and drove a spade deep into the soil. According to what Parson says. What happened to the roses? Mary asked again, more interested than ever. They was left to themselves. Mary was becoming quite excited. Did they quite die? Do roses quite die when they are left to themselves, she ventured. Well, I'd got to like em, and I like her, and she liked them. Ben Weatherstaff admitted reluctantly. Once or twice a year, I go and work at them a bit. Prune them and dig about the roots. They run wild, but they was in rich soil, and some of them lived. When they had no leaves and look grey and brown and dry, how can you tell whether they are dead or alive? inquired Mary. Wait till the spring gets at them. Wait till the sun shines on the rain, and the rain falls on the sunshine, and then thou'll find out. How? How? cried Mary, forgetting to be careful. Look at the twigs and branches, and if thou see a bit of brown lump swelling here and there, watch it after the warm rain and see what happens. He stopped suddenly and looked curiously at her eager face. Why does thou care so much about roses and such, all of a sudden? he demanded. Mistress Mary felt her face grow red. She was almost afraid to answer. I, I want to play that, that I have a garden of my own, she stammered. I, there is nothing for me to do. I have nothing and no one. Well, said Ben Weatherstaff slowly, as he watched her. That's true. There hasn't. He said it in such an odd way that Mary wondered if he was actually a little sorry for her. She had never felt sorry for herself. She had only felt tired and cross, because she disliked people and things so much. But now the world seemed to be changing and getting nicer. If no one found out about the secret garden, she should enjoy herself always. She stayed with him for ten or fifteen minutes longer, and asked him as many questions as she dared. He answered every one of them in his queer, grunting way, and he did not seem really cross and did not pick up his spade and leave her. He said something about roses just as she was going away, and it reminded her of the ones he had said he had been fond of. Do you go and see those other roses now? she asked. Not been this year. My rheumatics has made me too stiff in the joints. He said it in his grumbling voice. And then, quite suddenly, he seemed to get angry with her, 
though she did not see why he should. Now look here, he said sharply. Don't uh, ask so many questions. That the worst wench for asking questions I've ever come across. Get thee gone and play thee. I've done talking for today. And he said it so crossly that she knew there was not the least use in staying another minute. She went skipping slowly down the outside walk, thinking him over and saying to herself that, queer as it was, here was another person whom she liked in spite of his crossness. She liked old Ben Weatherstaff. Yes, she did like him. She always wanted to try to make him talk to her. Also, she began to believe that he knew everything in the world about flowers. There was a laurel-hedged walk which curved round the secret garden, and ended at the gate which opened into a wood in the park. She thought she would slip round this walk and look into the wood and see if there were any rabbits hopping about. She enjoyed the skipping very much, and when she reached the little gate, she opened it and went through because she heard a low, peculiar whistling sound, and wanted to find out what it was. It was a very strange thing indeed. She quite caught her breath as she stopped to look at it. A boy was sitting under a tree, with his back against it, playing on a rough wooden pipe. He was a funny-looking boy, about twelve. He looked very clean, and his nose turned up, and his cheeks were as red as poppies. And never had Mistress Mary seen such round and such blue eyes in any boy's face. And on the trunk of the tree he leaned against, a brown squirrel was clinging and watching him, and from behind a bush nearby a cock pheasant was delicately stretching his neck to peep out. And quite near him were two rabbits sitting up and sniffing with tremendous noses. And actually it appeared as if they were all drawing near to watch him and listen to the strange low little call his pipe seemed to make. When he saw Mary, he held up his hand and spoke to her in a voice almost as low as, and rather like his piping. Don't them move, he said. It flight them. Mary remained motionless. He stopped playing his pipe, and began to rise from the ground. He moved so slowly that it scarcely seemed as though he were moving at all. But at last he stood on his feet, and then the squirrel scampered back up into the branches of his tree. The pheasant withdrew his head, and the rabbits dropped on all fours and began to hop away, though not at all as they were frightened. I'm Dickon, the boy said. I know thou'rt Miss Mary. Then Mary realized that somehow she had known at first that he was Dickon. Who else could have been charming rabbits and pheasants as the natives charm snakes in India? He had a white, red, curving mouth, and his smile spread all over his face. I got up slow, he explained, because if there makes a quick move, it startles them. A body has to move gentle and speak low when wild things is about. He did not speak to her as if they had never seen each other before, but as if he knew her quite well. Mary knew nothing about boys, and she spoke to him a little stiffly because she felt rather shy. Did you get Martha's letter? she asked. He nodded his curly, rust-colored head. That's why I come. He stooped to pick up something which had been lying on the ground beside him when he piped. I've got the garden tools. There's a little spade and rake and a fork and hoe. Eh? They're good uns. 
There's a trowel too, and the woman in the shop threw in a packet of white poppy, and one or blue larkspur when I bought the other seats. Will you show the seats to me? Mary said. She wished she could talk as he did. His speech was so quick and easy. It sounded as if he liked her, and was not at least afraid she would not like him. Though he was only a common moor boy, in patched clothes and with a funny face and a rough, rusty red head. As she came closer to him, she noticed that there was a clean, fresh scent of heather and grass and leaves about him, almost as if he were made of them. She liked it very much, and when she looked into his funny face, with the red cheeks and round blue eyes, she forgot that she had felt shy. Let us sit down on this log and look at them, she said. They sat down, and he took a clumsy little brown paper package out of his coat pocket. He untied the string, and inside there were ever so many neater and smaller packages, with a picture of a flower on each one. There's a lot of mignonette and poppies, he said. Mignonette's the sweetest smelling things as gross, and it'll grow wherever you cast it, same as poppies will. And them as come up and bloom if you just whistle to them. Them's the nicest of all. He stopped and turned his head quick. His poppy-cheeked face lighted up. Where's that robin as is calling us? He said. The chirp came from a thick holly bush, bright with scarlet berries, and Mary thought she knew whose it was. Is it really calling us? she asked. Aye, said Dickon, as if it was the most natural thing in the world. He's calling someone he's friends with. That same as saying, here I am, look at me. I want a bit of chat. There he is in the bush. Whose is he? He's Ben Witherstaff's, but I think he knows me a little, answered Mary. Aye, he knows thee, said Dickon in his low voice again. And he likes thee. He's took thee on. He'll tell me all about thee in a minute. He moved quite close to the bush with the slow movement Mary had noticed before. And then he made a sound, almost like the robin's own twitter. The robin listened a few seconds, intently and then answered quite as if he were replying to a question. Aye, he's a friend of yours, chuckled Dickon. Do you think he is? cried Mary eagerly. She did so want to know. Do you think he really likes me? He wouldn't come near thee if he didn't, answered Dickon. Birds is rare choosers and a robin can flout a body worse than a man. See, he's making up to thee now. Cannot thou see a chap, he's saying. And it really seemed as if it must be true. He so sidled and twittered and tilted as he hopped on his bush. Do you understand everything birds say? Dickens' grin spread until he seemed all white, red, curving mouth, and he rubbed his rough head. I think I do, and they think I do, he said. I've lived on the moor with them so long. I've watched them break shell, and come out and fledge and learn to fly and begin to sing, till I think I'm one of them. Sometimes I think perhaps I'm a bird, or a fox, or a rabbit, or a squirrel, or even a beetle. And I don't know it. He laughed and came back to the log, and began to talk about the flower seeds again. He told her what they looked like when they were flowers. He told her how to plant them, and watch them, and feed, and water them. See here, he said suddenly, turning round to look at her. I'll plant them for thee myself. Where's the garden? Mary's thin hands clutched each other as they lay on her lap. 
she did not know what to say, so for a whole minute she said nothing. She had never thought of this. She felt miserable, and she felt as if she went red and then pale. Thus got a bit of garden, hasn't thou? Dickon said. It was true that she had turned red, and then pale. Dickon saw her do it, and as she still said nothing, he began to be puzzled. Wouldn't they give thee a bit? he asked. Hasn't I got any yet? She held her hands tighter and turned her eyes toward him. I don't know anything about boys, she said slowly. Could you keep a secret if I told you one? It's a great secret. I don't know what I should do if anyone found it out. I believe I should die. She said the last sentence quite fiercely. Dickon looked more puzzled than ever, and even rubbed his hand over his rough head again. But he answered quite good-humouredly. I'm keeping secrets all the time, he said. If I couldn't keep secrets from the other lads, secrets about foxes' cubs and birds' nests, and wild things' holes, there's be not safe on the moor. I, I can keep secrets. Mistress Mary did not mean to put out her hand and clutch his leaf, but she did. I've stolen a garden, she said very fast. It isn't mine, it isn't anybody's. Nobody wants it, nobody cares for it, nobody ever goes into it. Perhaps everything is dead in it already. I don't know. She began to feel hot and as contrary as she had ever felt in her life. I don't care. I don't care. Nobody has any right to take it from me when I care about it and they don't. They are letting it die, all shut in by itself. She ended passionately, and she threw her arms over her face and burst out crying. Poor little Mistress Mary. Dickens' curious blue eyes grew rounder and rounder. Eh, 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 he said, drawing his exclamation out slowly. And the way he did it meant both wonder and sympathy. I've nothing to do, said Mary. Nothing belongs to me. I found it myself and I got into it myself. I was only just like the robin, and they wouldn't take it from the robin. Where is it? asked Dickon in a dropped voice. Mistress Mary got up from the log at once. She knew she felt contrary again, and obstinate, and she did not care at all. She was imperious and Indian, and at the same time hot and sorrowful. Come with me and I'll show you, she said. She led him round the laurel path and to the walk where the ivy grew so thickly. Dickon followed her with a queer, almost pitying look on his face. He felt as if he were being led to look at some strange bird's nest and must move softly. When she stepped to the wall and lifted the hanging ivy, he started. There was a door, and Mary pushed it slowly open and they passed in together, and then Mary stood and waved her hand round defiantly. It's this, she said. It's a secret garden, and I'm the only one in the world who wants it to be alive. Dickon looked round and round about it, and round and round again. Hey, he almost whispered, it's a queer pretty place. It's like as if a body was in a dream. Chapter 11 The Nest of the Missile Thrush For two or three minutes he stood looking around him, while Mary watched him, and then he began to walk about softly, 
even more lightly than Mary had walked the first time she had found herself inside the four walls. His eyes seemed to be taking in everything. The great trees, with the great creepers climbing over them, and hanging from the branches, and the tangle on the walls and among the grass. The evergreen alcoves with the stone seats and tall flower urns standing in them. I never thought I'd see this place, he said at last in a whisper. Did you know about it? asked Mary. She had spoken aloud, and he made a sign to her. We must talk low, he said, or someone will hear us and wonder what's to do in here. Oh, I forgot, said Mary, feeling frightened and putting a hand quickly against her mouth. Did you know about the garden? she asked again when she had recovered herself. Dickon nodded. Martha told me there was one as no one ever went inside, he answered. Us used to wonder what it was like. He stopped and looked round at the lovely grey tangle about him, and his round eyes looked queerly happy. Eh, the nest'll be here come springtime, he said. It be the safest nesting place in England. No one never come in near and tangles or trees and roses to build in. I wonder all the birds on the moor don't build here. Mistress Mary put a hand on his arm again without knowing it. Will there be roses? she whispered. Can you tell? I thought perhaps they were all dead. Eh, no. Not them, not all of them, he answered. Look here. He stepped over to the nearest tree, an old, old one with grey lichen all over its bark, but upholding a curtain of tangled sprays and branches. He took a thick knife out of his pocket and opened one of its blades. There's a lot of dead wood as ought to be cut out, he said, and there's a lot of old wood but it made some new last year. This here's a new bit, and he touched a shoot, which looked brownish-green instead of hard dry grey. Mary touched it herself in an eager, reverent way. That one, she said, is that one quite alive, quite? Dickon curved his wide, smiling mouth. It's as wick as you or me, he said, and Mary remembered that Martha had told her that wick meant alive or lively. I'm glad it's wick, she cried out in her whisper. I want them all to be wick. Let us go round the garden and count how many wick ones there are. She quite panted with eagerness, and Dickon was as eager as she was. They went from tree to tree and bush to bush. Dickon carried his knife in his hand and showed her things which she thought wonderful. They've run wild, he said, but the strongest ones has fair thrived on it. The delicatest ones has died out, but the others has growed and growed, and spread and spread, till days a wonder. See here. And he pulled down a thick, grey, dry-looking branch. A body might think this was dead wood. But I don't believe it is down to the root. I'll cut it low down and see. He knelt, and with his knife cut the lifeless-looking branch through, not far above the earth. There, he said exultantly. I told thee so. There's green in that wood yet. Look at it. Mary was down on her knees before he spoke, gazing with all her might. When it looks a bit greenish and juicy like that, it's wick, he explained. When the inside is dry and breaks easy, like this here piece I've cut off, it's done for. There's a big root here, as all this life wood sprung out of. And if the old wood's cut off and it's dug round and took care of, there'll be... He stopped and lifted his face to look up at the climbing and hanging sprays above him. There'll be a fountain of roses here this summer. 
They went from bush to bush and from tree to tree. He was very strong and clever with his knife, and he knew how to cut the dry and dead wood away, and could tell when an unpromising bow or twig had still green life in it. In the course of half an hour, Mary thought she could tell too, and when he cut through a lifeless-looking branch, she would cry out joyfully under her breath when she caught sight of the least shade of moist green. The spade, the hoe, the fork were very useful. He showed her how to use the fork while he dug about roots with the spade and stirred the earth and let the air in. They were working industriously around one of the biggest standard roses when he caught sight of something which made him utter an exclamation of surprise. Why, he cried, pointing to the grass a few feet away, who did that there? It was one of Mary's own little clearings round the pale green points. I did it, said Mary. Why, I thought thou didn't know nothing about gardening, he exclaimed. I don't, she answered, but they were so little, and the grass was so thick and strong and they looked as if they had no room to breathe. So I made a place for them. I don't even know what they are. Dickon went and knelt down by them, smiling his white smile. That was right, he said. A gardener couldn't have told thee better. They'll grow now like Jack's beanstalk. They're crocuses and snowdrops. And this here is Narcissus, turning to another patch. And here's Daffodondilies. A, eh, they will be a sight. He ran from one clearing to another. Da has done a lot of work for such a little wrench, he said, looking her over. I'm growing fatter, said Mary, and I'm growing stronger. I used always to be tired. When I dig, I'm not tired at all. I like to smell the earth when it's turned up. It's rare good for thee, he said, nodding his head wisely. There's not as nice as the smell of good clean earth, except the smell of fresh growing things when the rain falls on them. I get out on the moor many a day when it's raining, and I lie under a bush and listen to the soft swish of drops and the heather and I just sniff and sniff. My nose and fair quivers like a rabbit's, mother says. Do you never catch cold? inquired Mary, gazing at him wonderingly. She had never seen such a funny boy, or such a nice one. Not me, he said, grinning. I never catch cold since I was born. I wasn't brought up nesh enough. I've chased about the moor in all weathers, same as the rabbits does. Mother says I've sniffed up too much fresh air for twelve year to ever get to sniffin' with cold. I'm as tough as a white thorn knobstick. He was working all the time he was talking, and Mary was following him and helping him with her fork or the trowel. There's a lot of work to do here, he said once, looking about quite exultantly. Will you come again and help me do it? Mary begged. I'm sure I can help too. I can dig and pull up weeds, and do whatever you tell me. Oh, do come, Dickon. I'll come every day if thou wants me, rain or shine, he answered stoutly. It's the best fun I ever had in my life, shut in here and wakening up a garden. If you will come, said Mary, if you will help me to make it a life, I'll... I don't know what I'll do. She ended helplessly. What could you do for a boy like that? I'll tell thee what'll do, said Dickon with his happy grin. Thou'll get fat, and thou'll get as hungry as a young fox, and thou'll learn how to talk to the robin same as I do. Eh, we'll have a lot of fun. He began to walk about, looking up in the trees and at the walls and bushes with thoughtful expression. I wouldn't want to make it look like a gardener's garden, 
all clippin' and spick and span. Would you? he said. It's nicer like this, with things running wild and swinging and catching hold of each other. Don't let us make it tidy, said Mary anxiously. It wouldn't seem like a secret garden if it was tidy. Dickens stood, rubbing his rusty red head with a rather puzzled look. It's a secret garden, sure enough, he said. But seems like someone besides the robin must have been in it since it was shut up ten years ago. But the door was locked and the key was buried, said Mary. No one could get in. That's true, he answered. It's a queer place. Seems to me as if there'd been a bit of pruning done here and there, later than ten years ago. But how could it have been done? said Mary. He was examining a branch of a standard rose, and he shook his head. Aye, how could it? he murmured, with the door locked and the key buried. Mistress Mary always felt that however many years she lived, she should never forget that first morning when her garden began to grow. Of course, it seemed to begin to grow for her that morning, when Dickon began to clear places to plant seeds. She remembered what Basil had sung at her when he wanted to tease her. Are there any flowers that look like bells? she inquired. Lilies or the valley does, he answered, digging away with the trowel. And there's Canterbury bells, and Campanulas. Let's plant some, said Mary. And there's Lily or the valley here already. I saw em. They have grown too close, and we'll have to separate them. But there's plenty. The other ones take two years to bloom from seed. But I can bring you some bits of plants from our cottage garden. Why dost thou want them? Then Mary told him about Basil, and his brothers, and sisters in India, and of how she had hated them and their calling her Mistress Mary quite contrary. They used to dance around and sing at me. They sang, Mistress Mary quite contrary, how does your garden grow, with silver bells and cockle shells, and marigolds all in a row. I just remembered it, and it made me wonder if there were really flowers like silver bells. She frowned a little, and gave her trowel a rather spiteful dig into the earth. I wasn't as contrary as they were. But Dickon laughed. Eh, he said, and as he crumbled the rich black soil, she saw he was sniffing up the scent of it. There doesn't seem to be no need for no one to be contrary when there's flowers and such like and such lots of friendly wild things running about, making homes for themselves, or building nests and singing and whistling, does there? Mary, kneeling by him, holding the seeds, looked at him and stopped frowning. Dickon, she said, you are as nice as Martha said you were. I like you, and you make the fifth person. I never thought I should like five people. Dickon sat up on his heels, as Martha did when she was polishing the grate. He did look funny and delightful, Mary thought, with his round blue eyes and red cheeks and happy-looking turned-up nose. Only five folk as thou likes, he said. Who's the other four? Your mother and Martha. Mary checked them off on her fingers. And the robin and Ben Weatherstaff. Dickon laughed, so as he was obliged to stifle the sound by putting his arm over his mouth. I know thou thinks I'm a queer lad, he said, but I think thou art the queerest little lass I ever saw. Then Mary did a strange thing. She leaned forward and asked him a question she had never dreamed of asking anyone before. And she tried to ask it in Yorkshire, because that was his language, and in India a native was always pleased if you knew his speech. Does the like me? she said. Eh, hey, he answered heartily. That I does. I likes thee wonderful, 
and so does the robin, I do believe. That's two, then, said Mary, that's two for me. And then they began to work harder than ever, and more joyfully. Mary was startled and sorry when she heard the big clock in the courtyard strike the hour of a midday dinner. I shall have to go, she said mournfully, and you will have to go too, won't you? Dickon grinned. My dinner's easy to carry about with me, he said. Mother always lets me put a bit of something in my pocket. He picked up his coat from the grass and brought out of a pocket a lumpy little bundle tied up in a quite clean, coarse blue and white handkerchief. It held two thick pieces of bread with a slice of something laid between them. It's often as not but bread, he said, but I've got a fine slice of fat bacon with it today. Mary thought it looked a queer dinner, but he seemed ready to enjoy it. Run on and get thy victuals, he said. I'll be done with mine first. I'll get some more work done before I start back home. He sat down with his back against the tree. I'll call the robin up, he said, and give him the rind of the bacon to pack at. They likes a bit of fat wonderful. Mary could scarcely bear to leave him. Suddenly it seemed as if he might be a sort of wood fairy, who might be gone when she came into the garden again. He seemed too good to be true. She went slowly halfway to the door in the wall, and then she stopped and went back. Whatever happens, you, you never would tell, she said. His poppy-colored cheeks were distended with his first big bite of bread and bacon, but he managed to smile encouragingly. If thou was a missile thrush, and showed me where thy nest was, dost thou think I'd tell anyone? Not me, he said. Thou art as safe as a missile thrush. And she was quite sure she was. Chapter 12 Might I have a bit of earth? Mary ran so fast that she was rather out of breath when she reached her room. Her hair was ruffled on her forehead, and her cheeks were bright pink. Her dinner was waiting on the table, and Martha was waiting near it. That's a bit late, she said. Where's the bin? I've seen Dickon, said Mary. I've seen Dickon. I knew he'd come said Martha exultantly. How does thou like him? I think, I think he's beautiful, said Mary in a determined voice. Martha looked rather taken aback, but she looked pleased too. Well, she said, he's the best lad as ever was born. But us never thought he was handsome. His nose turns up too much. I like it to turn up, said Mary. And his eyes is so round, said Martha, a trifle doubtful. Though they're a nice color. I like them round, said Mary, and they are exactly the color of the sky over the moor. Martha beamed with satisfaction. Mother says he made him that color with always looking up at the birds and the clouds. But he has got a big mouth, hasn't he now? I love his big mouth said Mary obstinately. I wish mine were just like it. Martha chuckled delightedly. It look rare and funny in thy bit of face, she said. But I know it would be that way when thou saw him. How did thou like the seats and the garden tools? How did you know he brought them? asked Mary. Eh, I never thought of him not bringing them. He'd be sure to bring him if they was in Yorkshire. He's such a trusty lad. Mary was afraid that she might begin to ask difficult questions, but she did not. She was very much interested in the seeds and gardening tools, and there was only one moment when Mary was frightened. 
This was when she began to ask where the flowers were to be planted. Who did they ask about it? she inquired. I haven't asked anybody yet, said Mary, hesitating. Well, I wouldn't ask the head gardener. He's too grand, Mr. Roaches. I've never seen him, said Mary. I've only seen undergardeners and Ben Weatherstaff. If I was you, I'd ask Ben Weatherstaff, advised Martha. He's not half as bad as he looks, for all he's so crabbed. Mr. Craven lets him do what he likes, because he was here when Mrs. Craven was alive, and he used to make her laugh. She liked him. Perhaps he'd find you a corner somewhere out of the way. If it was out of the way, and no one wanted it, no one could mind my having it, could they? There wouldn't be no reason, answered Martha. You wouldn't do no harm. Mary ate her dinner as quickly as she could, and when she rose from the table, she was going to run to her room to put on her hat again, but Martha stopped her. I've got something to tell you, she said. I thought I'd let you eat your dinner first. Mr. Craven came back this morning, and I think he wants to see you. Mary turned quite pale. Oh, she said. Why? Why? He didn't want to see me when I came. I heard Pitcher say he didn't. Well, explained Martha, Mrs. Medlock says it's because of Mother. She was walking to Thwaite Village, and she met him. She'd never spoke to him before, but Mrs. Craven had been to our cottage two or three times. He'd forgot, but Mother hadn't, and she made bold to stop him. I don't know what she said to him about you, but she said something as put him in the mind to see you before he goes away again, tomorrow. Oh, cried Mary, he is going away tomorrow. I am so glad. He's going for a long time. He mayn't come back till autumn or winter. He's going to travel in foreign places. He's always doing it. Oh, I'm so glad, so glad, said Mary thankfully. If he did not come back until winter, or even autumn, there would be time to watch the secret garden come alive. Even if he found out then and took it away from her, she would have had that much at least. When do you think he will want to see? She did not finish the sentence, because the door opened and Mrs. Medlock walked in. She had on her best black dress and cap, and her collar was fastened with a large brooch, with a picture of a man's face on it. It was a colored photograph of Mr. Medlock, who had died years ago and she always wore it when she was dressed up. She looked nervous and excited. Your hair is rough, she said quickly. Go and brush it. Martha helped her to slip on her best dress. Mr. Craven sent me to bring her to him in his study. All the pink left Mary's cheeks. Her heart began to thump, and she felt herself changing into a stiff, plain, silent child again. She did not even answer Mrs. Medlock, but turned and walked into her bedroom, followed by Martha. She said nothing while her dress was changed, and her hair brushed, and after she was quite tidy, she followed Mrs. Medlock down the corridors in silence. What was there for her to say? She was obliged to go and see Mr. Craven, and he would not like her, and she would not like him. She knew what he would think of her. She was taken to a part of the house she had not been into before. At last, Mrs. Medlock knocked at the door, and when someone said, Come in, they entered the room together. A man was sitting in an armchair before the fire, and Mrs. Medlock spoke to him. This is Miss Mary, sir, she said. You can go and leave her here. I will ring for you when I want you to take her away, said Mr. Craven. When she went out and closed the door, Mary could only stand waiting. 
a plain little thing, twisting her thin hands together. She could see that the man in the chair was not so much a hunchback as a man with high, rather crooked shoulders, and he had black hair streaked with white. He turned his head over his high shoulders and spoke to her. Come here, he said. Mary went to him. He was not ugly. His face would have been handsome if it had not been so miserable. He looked as if the sight of her worried and fretted him, and as if he did not know what in the world to do with her. Are you well? he asked. Yes, answered Mary. Do they take good care of you? Yes. He rubbed his forehead fretfully as he looked her over. You are thin, he said. I am getting fatter, Mary answered in what she knew was her stiffest way. What an unhappy face he had. His black eyes seemed as if they scarcely saw her, as if they were seeing something else, and he could hardly keep his thoughts upon her. I forgot you, he said. How could I remember you? I intended to send you a governess or a nurse or someone of that sort. But I forgot. Please, began Mary, please. And then the lump in her throat choked her. What do you want to say? he inquired. I am, I am too big for a nurse, said Mary. And please, please don't make me have a governess yet. He rubbed his forehead again, and stared at her. That was what the Sowerby woman said, he muttered absent-mindedly. Then Mary gathered a scrap of courage. Is she, is she Martha's mother? she stammered. Yes, I think so, he replied. She knows about children, said Mary. She is twelve, she knows. He seemed to rouse himself. What do you want to do? I want to play out of doors, Mary answered, hoping that her voice did not tremble. I never liked it in India. It makes me hungry here, and I am getting fatter. He was watching her. Mrs. Sowerby said it would do you good. Perhaps it will, he said. She thought you had better get stronger before you had a governess. It makes me feel strong when I play, and the wind comes over the moor, argued Mary. Where do you play? he asked next. Everywhere, gasped Mary. Martha's mother sent me a skipping rope. I skip and run, and I look about to see if things are beginning to stick up out of the earth. I don't do any harm. Don't look so frightened, he said in a worried voice. You could not do any harm, a child like you. You may do what you like. Mary put a hand up to her throat, because she was afraid he might see the excited lump which she felt jump into it. She came a step nearer to him. May I, she said tremulously. Her anxious little face seemed to worry him more than ever. Don't look so frightened, he exclaimed. Of course you may. I am your guardian, though I am a poor one for any child. I cannot give you time or attention. I am too ill and wretched and distracted. But I wish you to be happy and comfortable. I don't know anything about children, but Mrs. Medlock is to see that you have all you need. I sent for you today because Mrs. Sowerby said I ought to see you. Her daughter had talked about you. She thought you need fresh air and freedom and running about. She knows all about children, Mary said again in spite of herself. She ought to, said Mr. Craven. I thought her rather bold to stop me on the moor, but she said Mrs. Craven had been kind to her. It seemed hard for him to speak his dead wife's name. She is a respectable woman. 
Now I have seen you, I think she said sensible things. Play out of doors as much as you like. It's a big place, and you may go where you like, and amuse yourself as you like. Is there anything you want? As if a sudden thought had struck him. Do you want toys, books, dolls? Might I, quavered Mary, might I have a bit of earth? In her eagerness, she did not realize how queer the words would sound, and that they were not the ones she had meant to say. Mr. Craven looked quite startled. Earth, he repeated. What do you mean? To plant seeds in, to make things grow, to see them come alive, Mary faltered. He gazed at her a moment, and then passed his hand quickly over his eyes. Do you care about gardens so much? he said slowly. I didn't know about them in India, said Mary. I was always ill and tired, and it was too hot. I sometimes made little beds in the sand and stuck flowers in them, but here it is different. Mr. Craven got up and began to walk slowly across the room. A bit of earth he said to himself, and Mary thought that somehow she must have reminded him of something. When he stopped and spoke to her, his dark eyes looked almost soft and kind. You can have as much earth as you want, he said. You remind me of someone else who loved the earth and things that grow. When you see a bit of earth you want, with something like a smile, take it, child and make it come alive. May I take it from anywhere if that's not wanted? Anywhere, he answered. There, you must go now. I am tired. He touched the bell to call Mrs. Medlock. Goodbye, I shall be away all summer. Mrs. Medlock came so quickly that Mary thought she must have been waiting in the corridor. Mrs. Medlock, Mr. Craven said to her, Now I have seen the child. I understand what Mr. Sowerby meant. She must be less delicate before she begins lessons. Give her simple, healthy food. Let her run wild in the garden. Don't look after her too much. She needs liberty and fresh air and romping about. Mrs. Sowerby is to come and see her now and then, and she may sometimes go to the cottage. Mrs. Medlock looked pleased. She was relieved to hear that she need not look after Mary too much. She had felt her a tiresome charge, and had indeed seen as little of her as she dared. In addition to this, she was fond of Martha's mother. Thank you, sir, she said. Susan Sowerby and me went to school together, and she's as sensible and good-hearted a woman as you'd find in a day's walk. I never had any children myself, and she's had twelve, and there never was healthier or better ones. Miss Mary can get no harm from them. I'd always take Susan Sowerby's advice about children myself. She's what you might call healthy-minded, if you understand me. I understand, Mr. Craven answered. Take Miss Mary away now and send Pitcher to me. When Mrs. Medlock left her at the end of her own corridor, Mary flew back to her room. She found Martha waiting there. Martha had, in fact, hurried back after she had removed the dinner service. I can have my garden, cried Mary. I may have it where I like. I'm not going to have a governess for a long time. Your mother is coming to see me, and I may go to your cottage. He says a little girl like me could not do any harm, and I may do what I like, anywhere. Eh, hey, said Martha delightedly, that was nice of him, wasn't it? Martha, said Mary solemnly, he is really a nice man. Only his face is so miserable, and his forehead is all drawn together. She ran as quickly as she could to the garden. She had been away so much longer 
than she had thought she should, and she knew Dickon would have to set out early on his five-mile walk. When she slipped through the door under the ivy, she saw he was not working where she had left him. The gardening tools were laid together under a tree. She ran to them, looking all around the place. But there was no Dickon to be seen. He had gone away, and the secret garden was empty, except for the robin, who had just flown across the wall and sat on a standard rose bush watching her. He's gone, she said woefully. Oh, was he, was he, was he only a wood fairy? Something white fastened to the standard rose bush caught her eye. It was a piece of paper, in fact. It was a piece of the letter she had printed for Martha to send to Dickon. It was fastened on the bush with a long thorn, and in a minute she knew Dickon had left it there. There were some roughly printed letters on it and a sort of picture. At first she could not tell what it was. Then she saw it was meant for a nest with a bird sitting on it. Underneath were the printed letters, and they said, I will come 